It's time! The ATM, apologise to me, podcast. Martin Devlin this side, Mark Watson the other. It's episode 20, Watto. Yeah, I feel like we're, it's an anniversary almost, isn't it, Marty? I mean, I've bought you a gift. Have you bought me a gift? You bring me the gift of opinion. I bring you the gift of reality is what it is, okay? Is that a fair exchange at Christmas? Oh, that's right. You didn't have any money left because you spent it all on Fozzy and your all black oh, B minus team. Oh, here we go. Oh, here we your start. little B minus team. Did, it go? Did you go to the shop at Mediocrity and purchase something from that, Marty? Apologise to me! I tell you what, the shop of mediocrity was shut today because Japan brought everything in it with that penalty shootout. Were they the softest, weakest, limpest penalties you've ever seen? Well, I've got to say, I was just blown away because normally from the Japanese and a lot of the Asian countries, they're just so well rehearsed in those things. They're just so technically very good. I thought if this goes to a penalty, Japan will win this. They just don't miss. But that just shows the pressure of a FIFA Football World Cup, doesn't it? And isn't life cruel, though? You can be the best football player, you could be the best husband, best father, and then you go to a penalty shootout, you miss, cost your country a place in the next round, cost your country a place in history, and you live with that. It's a life sentence, the if-only moment. Um, Rod Dixon experienced it in 1976, finishing fourth in that 5,000 metres, and you talk to Rod, it was like winning New York in 83, got rid of that if-only in my life, but it haunted me. So imagine being a footballer, missing a penalty, and particularly as you know, we start to move through quarterfinals, semifinals, and boy, imagine missing a penalty in a World Cup final. Well, oh, ask Baggio, mate. I mean, and, 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 and then that penalty shootout in 94, people always think, oh, Baggio lost it. No, 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 the Italian captain missed the first one. So, you know, yeah. but no one even remembers that. Brazil, absolutely imperious today. That game was over after the first goal. I mean, who's going to beat that team? And don't tell me it's old England. No, it's not. It's not. Look, I, I think... I think whoever wins out of England and France will go through to the final, but I think Brazil now have made a statement. Brazil very much the team to beat. It wouldn't surprise me if it's a repeat of the 98 final between the French and the Brazilians, but yeah, you want to make a statement. Uh, we've just seen Brazil do it, but just the cohesion, the individual brilliance, um, just a remarkable side, arguably the best goalkeeper who happens to be a Liverpool, a Liverpool boy in goals too. So yeah, big statement from them. Um, yeah, look, it, it, a lot of people are thinking even a little, little ahead of themselves um, with the England team. I mean, they take on France, and you go through that side, you know, Dembele, uh, Griezmann, Mbappe, <laughs> Giroud, I mean, Varane. It, it's a hell of a side, France, and it'll be interesting to see how they play England. I think if they press England high, I still think there are major weaknesses in that England defence still. But, boy, what a mouthwatering World Cup. And yeah, look brilliant. at the quarterfinals. I mean, we've got Argentina, Netherlands. After this weekend... Four of those teams are going home. It's, it, it's you know, England, France. Someone misses out. A nation mourns, a nation celebrates. It's just the most... It's the best tournament in the world. Come on. Let's be, yeah, let's be honest. And every other World Cup is a pretender. And, you know, listen closely, rugby, for both men's and women's World Cups. You are a zit on the world stage of sport. Yes, you're important hey. to us, but you aren't a global sport. This is the one true World Cup. I think probably the International Basketball Federation, when they have their world tournament, even though the World Championship of Basketball is actually the NBA, but it's probably the other sport in the world where most countries actually play it. But nothing compares to this. I mean, FIFA have oh, a mortgage. Oh, on this, come, yeah, but, but come on, come on. I mean, if you, yeah, but come on, what about the Women's Rugby World Cup? Oh, I mean, stop it. See, I knew you'd have you not read the journal- Have you not read the journalists in this country, mate? I mean, don't come be on, down mate. More, that, people mate. I mean, it is more, people, it is. more people watched it than the moon landing. <laughs> <laughs> ATM, it's apologised to me and Mark Watson is with us. All right, just before we move on to other topics, Gareth Southgate, I was just kicking him yesterday. How the hell have you selected Henderson? You're so conservative, mate. But, the, you know, this is, this is where England, this is, this is the foot trip for them. Yes, you beat Senegal 3-0. You set up defensive. You've got a slow, ponderous defence uh, that only rugby tackles people as they go past. You are going to get caught out if, uh, by, by somebody with lightning pace like Mbappe. And I actually think, look, um, I'll, I'll, I'll maintain. I got it wrong yesterday, Southgate. You were absolutely right. But if you continue to select a side like that, you are not going to win this tournament unless you go nil alls and penalty shootouts. Yeah, interesting. Walker, Stone is Maguire, Shaw. Um, boy, Maguire gives a lot of ball away, doesn't he? He has been awful for Manchester United, still not convinced. Stone is um, not 100% convinced. I think they've got the right guy in Walker. I like Luke Shaw, but I think there are weaknesses. Yeah, Jordan Henderson. Um, I was really pleased for Jordan Henderson, but I'd 
still probably start Foden in the midfield, keep belling them, keep Rice, um, and then look at maybe just sort of propping up uh, that forward pack, whether it be Rashford, um, and just yeah, just bring even more. Possibly even look at Mason Mount coming into midfield, but just just giving this team even more youthful exuberance. But I guess it, how much emphasis do you place on experience, Martin? I mean, they're those intangible things, yeah, aren't they? Yeah. And, and you do hear a lot of praise being, um, you know, a lot of praise going towards Jordan Henderson from the likes of Saka, saying, look, this this guy just brings just brings that experience, that calming influence, or just that little bit of instruction at key times. Yeah, he's got this. Look, he's been there and done that, and that's and look, we saw in the European Championship final last year when Southgate made the monumental mistake of bringing on those young boys, Saka and Rashford, with a minute to go of extra time. They hadn't even kicked a football for 120 minutes, and then he brings them on for a penalty shootout, and you know, and obviously the pressure got to them. So, I mean, look, you know, you, you can't deny what the guy's done so far. He's got England through to yet another quarter final, and that's three major football championships in the last what four or five years. He's got a final, he's got a semi final, and now he's in a quarter final against France. You can't deny. It. Apologise to me! Rugby, Watto. And it's the merry coaching go round again, isn't it? Gatland ah, back for Wales. Pivac has gone. Eddie Jones looks as though he's going to get the shafter. Um, Borthwick will take that job. That's what we're hearing. Whether Dave Rennie stays, we don't know. So what do you make of it in the Northern Hemisphere before we even start with our lot? Courage. That's what I like. Courage from the unions to make key decisions to make the change, highlighting this rubbish about having to build for four years and coaches being able to fall back on poor performance and saying, yeah, but we're building judges on the World Cup. Absolute, utter nonsense. England know that this Rugby World Cup is still there for the winning, even with the changing of a coach. So do Wales. They're smart enough to know that four or five months out that you can change your coach and still win the World Cup. But they're bringing in guys who are best suited to the style. That is about, you know, being confrontational at the breakdown. That's about playing that 10-man game. That's what England want. And I think you'll start to see that again with Wales as well. So really, really courageous decisions. It's a shame that we don't have that type of leadership or, or, or the guts here to make those decisions. And it just shows how much of an old boys network still tends to run things behind the scenes here with New Zealand rugby. And uh, boy, I tell you what, England, I think now, um, both, um, sorry, um, Borthwick comes in and takes over England. I think they've got a real shot. I mean, they're on the easiest side of the draw at the Rugby World Cup. And I wouldn't rule Wales out under Gatlin. Gatlin doesn't get the recognition here because the style of rugby here doesn't suit his coaching style. I think we saw that when he came in with the Chiefs. He really struggled with super rugby, didn't he? But go over there, um, you know, have that, have the big forwards, have the collision, and that is just Warren Gatlin's bread and butter, and he's been very, very successful with Wales. So, you know, we haven't really included Wales in the World Cup conversation, no. but, boy, I tell you what, six or seven months, and they can be part of that conversation. And it just goes back to what I said about... You know, this mentality that New Zealand, and I think to a degree, Dave, when you use the Australia constantly changing, constantly rotating, constantly experimenting, it's just nonsense. And, you know, I'll go back to September 2017, France getting, South Africa getting beaten here 57 0 two years later, won the Rugby World Cup. And I just wish, I just wish we would sort of just jump on that bandwagon, man. Apologise to me! Mark Watson, ATM. This is the podcast we do every single Tuesday. It's episode 20. Um, stay still a bit because your phone's cutting in and out there. Mark Robinson over the weekend interviewed. And once again, you sit there and you scratch your head afterwards. I got my head in my hands after. Look, I, I watched Ollie Ritchie's um, interview with him on TV3 or News Hub, and I thought it was great. I thought Ritchie asked all the right questions, mate. But the problem is with Robinson, he is a practiced politician. He is surrounded by PR guffers and fluffers. They write all the questions, so he knows he's prepared. He talks about things being in the right space. He he talks about honouring agreements. He talks about management cliches. And I mean, the guy should be running Sport New Zealand because that's exactly where his skill level lies. It's writing memos. It's shuffling emails. It's covering your butt. It's getting nothing done. Didn't inspire a single bit of confidence because once again, the guy is incapable of making a decision. And if I was Ian Foster, I'm not feeling safe. I know this guy's got a knife sitting there sharpening, waiting to stab me in the back as soon as he possibly can, as long as he protects his own position. This is the worst administration. New Zealand rugby has ever seen. And I, look, I'll tell you what, I've been working in sport for 25 years and we've seen some bozos in that place, mate. But Mark Robinson isn't a bozo. He's just ineffective. He's wet. He's limp. He's weak. And New Zealand rugby is going nowhere while he's at the helm. 
Yeah, indecisive, trying to keep everybody happy, doesn't have that natural leadership, doesn't really, I think, have a natural feel for it. Preordained um, for the position, was always going to get the job again. The old boys network kicks in. But very typical of what I've seen in high-performance sport NZ too, there's just a certain personality, just a certain type that tend to get these jobs and the people who are not going to cause a lot of trouble. They're not great visionaries. They're yes people. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and I think they're disingenuous, a lot of them. But they sort of are a little bit woke. Uh, they, you know, they get caught up in the box ticking exercises and, you know, not prepared to write a book that everybody else is prepared to read. I mean, you've got to ruffle feathers. You've got to turn it up. You've just got to change it up. And you've got to be decisive. And he's certainly not that. And, and you say it, you know, it's how often do you hear in sport? It, it, it starts at the top, you know, a, a, a fish rots from the head down. Mm. And I think that's very applicable to New Zealand rugby. And look, I, I, I'm over it. I was talking to an Australian correspondent the other day on a radio program, and we were just talking about even like, and I'm sort of digressing here a little bit, but just the fact that, you know, cricket's struggling to get crowd numbers and stuff. And a lot of it we think is, you know, to do with personality it's just not the personalities anymore. And, you know, and it's a big part of, you know, you talk about Mark Robertson not, you know, really having everything just been cliche, everything just being stage managed. Well, that follows now through to the players and the coaches and it's across all sport. And we, 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 the fan, we, we as people, stop trying to make out that we're perfect. We're all flawed. We all love a bit of a train wreck. We all just want some honesty. We want to see a bit of colour. We want to see the Nastasis and the... A, a, Mac and, and Rose and the Connors. Connors. We and do, the that's what we want to see. I totally agree, mate. Players, yeah. mate. And all the even administrators. See, I like a guy like Wayne, Wayne Brown, who's coming as mayor of Auckland. You don't need to, hey, just bring somebody in. 